Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I'm so excited about our guest today because this is a topic I really love and I think we all think about, which is how do we just get to be our happiest selves and what keeps us from being our happiest selves? Gretchen Rubin, you know all the answers to this. <laughs> we, want, we want to know everything you know. Oh, great. Well, I'm yeah. so happy to be here with I'm you glad. today. Well, you created the Happiness Project. We've got a new book called Happier at Home, which I can't wait to read and figure out how to be happier at, even at home. <laughs> Uh, and so we have a million questions for you. Everybody was very excited because Great. there's so much going on in the world yes. that kind of keeps us from being happy. So how do we get there with all this? So Absolutely. let's start right away. This is from Steve Joe, and he wants to know, what are three things I can do every day to bring more happiness into my life? What are habits that I need to establish? That's a really good question. It is a really good question yeah. because I think when there's hap when we think about happiness, it's easy to think about abstract, transcendent things, but the basics really matter. So the first thing Here it is, Steve, get ready. Get enough sleep. Oh. So many American adults are chronically sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody needs at least seven hours of sleep. So getting enough sleep will give you energy, focus, it'll help your immune, immune function, your mood. Um, they think it contributes to weight control. Uh -huh. So getting enough sleep. Another thing is to get some exercise. You do not need to go for an hour run or an hour spin class, but just even a 15 or 20 minute walk, uh -huh. especially if you're outside in the sunlight, really gives you a big boost of mm -hmm. energy and cheer. And then another thing is do something fun because it's very easy to go through day after day and you're just crossing things off your to-do list or doing things that you feel like you're right, obliged right, to do. Right. And having a little time when you do something that's just fun that you honestly look forward to and that you feel energizes you and you're not having a lot of expectations for yourself other than to just have fun right. really helps you get that lift that keeps yeah. you happy. And laughing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I know, yeah, even if it's just watching funny television right, for 10 exactly. minutes, something very simple. Exactly. I go to comedy shows when I'm feeling down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is from Paula H. Is happiness really a choice? Can we control our thoughts and become happier? Where do I begin? That's interesting. Is it a choice? It's interesting because people say that to me all the time and they, they say it so passionately that I think for some people it really does feel like a choice. To me, that's not the way I think about it. I think more about how can I change my actions in my everyday life in ways that are gonna make me happier. Mm -hmm. Now, happiness about, they think about 50% is genetically determined, and then about 10 to 20% is life circumstances, which is things like age, occupation, health, marital status, but then all the rest is very- And, and your economic status. Exactly. Right. Well, yeah. What's um, going on with your job? Yes, exactly. Um, but then all the rest is very much affected by the way that we think and the way that we act. And that's where we can really take action in our everyday. I, don't, I think for a lot of people it's hard to choose and just make a choice, but you can choose to go to bed on time, you can choose to make plans with a friend, you can choose to do actions that you know, are, you can choose to go to the comedy club. And those are the things that are gonna you make you happier. You can also choose not to engage in somebody else's yes. unhappiness. You yes, know? because ha moods are very, very contagious. Right. And just being around somebody for a few seconds, you start yes. catching that mood, yes. so you're right. Yeah. How do you insulate yourself from mm -hmm. other people's right, bad right. moods? So this person says, well, where do I begin? So I think you said before, with exercise and sleep and doing something that's fun. Yes. And I think doing something that's fun is really key. Um, and hanging out with people that are kind of up. Yeah, exactly, you know? because you catch that energy right. and that mood from right. them too. This is from Carla87. Is there any scientific data on what happiness actually is? Have there been studies about it? And what's the most surprising thing you've learned about happiness? Well, there's huge numbers of studies about it. Really? And there's something like 15 academic definitions of happiness. It's wow. like a very elusive concept that's very hard to define. So a lot of scientists really try to drill down, down on exactly what is happiness. Um, I think for the average person, it's, it's not as helpful to think about what exactly is happiness and is it bliss or contentment or satisfaction or peace, but to really think about, well, if I want to be happier, what would I do that would make me happier and not worry about the define, defining happiness, uh -huh. which can feel very frustrating, but just say like, well, what, are, what could I do today or next week or next month that's going to move me in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to worry about this final perfect outcome. All state, the whole yeah, state of yeah, yeah. yeah, what is that? How right. would you get there? How would you stay there? It's sort of imaginary. So in other words, you're saying, you could say to yourself, what can I do to make myself happy today? Yeah. Could I take a walk? Yes. Could I go visit my friend who always makes me laugh? Yeah, instead you of know? thinking like, 
what can I do to achieve perfect happiness? Right. Or what would her perfect happiness <laughs> right. be? But you're like, well, going for a walk, that would make me happier. Right. And then that, that feels much more manageable. And I think kind of a day-to-day -day reality yes. and way of thinking of it that's more accessible to somebody who's like not running a lab at a, at a university studying it. What about the most surprising thing you've learned about happiness? One of the things that constantly surprises me is how much clutter matters to people. It doesn't seem like it's that important in life, you know, like a messy coat closet or your car is filled with right. junk. And yet over and over people tell me that there's something about getting control of this stuff uh -huh. that makes them feel more in control of their life and get, they get so much cheer and so much of a lift from it. And I, so I've been very surprised by that because it seems like it's trivial. Uh -huh. And yet it also seems that it matters more than it should. Well, it's it bogs a, you down. It bogs you down. It makes <clears throat> you feel, a friend of mine said, I clean up my closets. I feel like I gained, I, I lost 10 pounds. <laughs> and I knew that feeling exactly. Yeah. Um, or there's something about just cleaning out a medicine cabinet. That and just, I read somewhere that you said uh, making your bed. Yeah. <clears throat> making your bed actually makes you happy. Yes, and of all the resolutions, I talk about hundreds of resolutions. Right. And whenever I, people tell me that some, they've tried it, I say, well, what did you try? What worked for you? And the number one resolution that people specifically mention that they tried and that makes them happier is make your bed. Now, what, do you, what do you think? I think it's a bunch of things. I think first, it's like you, cry, you, you get something, no matter how minor, accomplished. Right. First thing in your day. You're like, yeah. if I've done nothing else, well, I made my bed. <laughs> And there's something about just a room with a bed made just looks so much more orderly and inviting. And but, peaceful. And peaceful, right. exactly. And also your bedroom and your bed, it's kind of like a symbol of your soul. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's you in a way, in, in sort of a symbolic way. So when that feels orderly and inviting, then you feel more in control of yourself. And somewhere you're, you're pleasing your inner mommy. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah. <laughs> your inner mommy who said, yes. make your bed. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But then every once in a while, somebody says like, oh, my mother always made me make my bed, and now I don't, and I revel in it, and I love not making my bed. Well, that's your happiness. That's right. Exactly. Don't make your bed. Don't make your bed. Don't make your bed. This is from Alex. How do you stay happy when you feel the world is falling apart around you and you don't have two nickels to rub together? Whoa. Okay, guru. That is really tough. I mean, and there's sort of two ideas there. One is worrying about the whole world, like, right. you know, everything that's going on <clears throat> in the world. And the other is if you feel like your own personal situation is very uncertain right. and um and clearly one of the biggest happiness challenges is losing your job or worrying that you're going to lose your job right. that is a very very enormous happiness challenge and again sometimes just doing what you can within your current circumstances to try to be as happy as you can be because it's absolutely true that sometimes in our life it's not possible to be happy and it wouldn't even be appropriate to try to be happy right. things are happening that <clears throat> make you unhappy but you could say well what can i do to make myself as happy as i can be and i think when you do that you give yourself the emotional wherewithal to meet a challenging situation you know i know it sounds corny uh to say well the best things in life are free but i uh i interviewed bet midler oh. and she's from hawaii and she says she was very I didn't poor know that. yes she's very poor when she was growing up and uh, everybody around her in her neighborhood was very poor and she's hardly enough to eat and everything kind of shoddy. She says, but when you opened the door in Hawaii and you went outside, everything <gasps> else was free. Oh. The water was free, the sky was free. Flowers. The flowers, the fish, the beauty. She said it really made a complete a difference in my life that there was so much that was free, even though so much was deprived. So there's a really interesting way <laughs> to is. look at it. You know, when you are having a rough time, you know, that you... You know, what is free that you can enjoy, can enjoy? The, you know, the park. That's an excellent the, point. You know, the flowers, the birds. I know it sounds corny, but it's true. It really, I know sometimes when I'm feeling really down, or especially after my dad died and I was feeling very sad, when I'd go out in the park and walk around in the park and see the kids playing and see the flowers, it, it helped to sort of heal, you know? There's something about the beauty of nature. That yes. It's always, it's mm -hmm. very, it, it's calming, mm -hmm. it's energizing, it's right. beautiful, it's sort of transcendent, so yeah. you're in a higher state you get of something frame out. of mind. Yeah. There is something out there Beautiful that's... smells. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the sense of smell. Now. Are so you? The, the smells of being in nature are yes. really comforting, too. This is from Nini. My apartment is a mess. I'm one of those people that can't get to my tasks until it's clean. But oh. the clutter is just in piles. It's totally disorganized. Any tips on decluttering your home? I feel like I've been procrastinating this for years, and I really feel like it's gotten in the way of some of my goals. So we need 
tips yes. for decluttering. Okay, so here are some tips that we I follow. We love tips. Yeah, yes, yes. These are these are very these are very <laughs> small. The first is the one minute rule. Anything that you can do in less than a minute, do without delay. So if you have a stack of mail and you can throw away the junk mail, do it. If you can see a letter, open it up, scan it, and toss it or file it. If you can hang up your coat, if you can put the library books on the library bookshelf, if you can put the umbrella away. These little tasks, oh, that's good. because what happens is that if you postpone them, whenever you walk into a room, you're surrounded by all these little things which are not burdensome alone, but over, but the sum of them makes you feel paralyzed and right. oppressed. Right. So, do, so doing that, and several people have told me that this has totally, completely changed their life. The other thing that I do is every night before bed, I do a 20-minute tidy up. And this is not cleaning, but this is just putting dirty clothes in the hamper right. or putting books on the shelf or putting the recycling away. Right. And again, changing the bag, and yeah, yeah, one bag. Exactly, right? That's my it's biggest like, yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the dreaded task, unloading the dishwasher. Um, and this is just, and these things, this is if you, if you don't have time to do the, I'm going to spend the entire day in my closet. You know, these are just little ways that you can stay on top of it and slowly whittle your way down. Right. Because it, the, the problem is it gets bad enough that you feel like you would have to take a personal day from right. work you right. know, to deal with your coat closet. Right. Um, and so looking for small ways mm -hmm. to do it. Um, also, I have, a, I have, I for my, to deal with my digital photos, which became very oppressive to me. <laughs> I had a resolution to suffer for 15 minutes. I decided I would work on it for 15 minutes a day because I just couldn't bear the thought of working on it. I was so intimidated and horrified by what I had to get done. So if you just say, okay, for 15 minutes, I'm going to clean this room. And then that's, I set a timer, 15 minutes. Right. It's amazing after even a week. 15 minutes a day, you really get a lot done. And then yeah. you get that momentum and you feel more in control. Right. Yes. You don't have that sense of dread. Right, right. I know I did that with my files. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is Sherry. What have you found are the sources of happiness? Well, there's two ways to answer that question. If you were going to say, what's the key to happiness, depending right. on what your framework is. The mm -hmm. first, ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists agree that the key to happiness is relationships with other people. That's what makes people happy. Feeling connected, feeling that they have people they can confide in, feeling like they have long-term, deep relationships, feeling like they can get support, and just as important for happiness, give support. Mm -hmm. So you really need to feel connected to other people. Mm -hmm. But another way to answer that question is to say that the key to, to happiness is self-knowledge. Because you can only build a happy life on the foundation of your own nature. And if you're trying to construct a life around what other people think is right or what other people want you to want, it's not going to be right for you, so it's not going to make you happy. And so you have to be honest with yourself, which is surprisingly challenging, about what it is that does make you happy. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are, the, I would say, if you have self-knowledge and strong relationships with other people, mm -hmm. It's a very strong basis for a happy And life. also use those people. You know, go, go to them. Oh, yeah, no, that's you part of relationships, really, you yes. You really go Engagement. to them. Engagement. Yeah, Engagement. people sometimes yes. say, oh, I don't want to bother my yes. friend with this. But I always feel good when a friend comes to me and says, I just really need to talk this out with you. It always makes me feel good. That well, they... I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, if you want to make a friend, ask for a favor. Uh, and it's really true. When somebody yes. asks you for something, right. you feel more connected right. to them. Right, you do. It builds intimacy. And this is from Terry. Children are happy because they're happy in the moment. They're not laden down with what happened before. So are you saying that we need to be more in the moment to experience happiness? Yes, but I think that one of the real paradoxes of happiness is that you have to be very aware of the moment and experience the moment and take pleasure in the moment. But then you also need to think about the future and the implications of your actions for the future. Because if you only live in the present, you're probably going to make decisions that aren't going to make you happy over the long run. You mean instant grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, if you, but if you spend all your time worrying about the future, then, you, what, then what is life? Because life is now. But people, now is only all we have. But people also worry so much about the past. Well, yeah, that. I mean, the great thing about yes. kids, you know, they fall they down have, and yeah, they, they yes. get to cut themselves and you give them a cookie and they're happy again. You yes, know? yes, they get, yes. They get out of that bad yes. moment, get to a happy moment. Yes. I think that's kind of what this woman is talking about. Yes, yeah. is to find that. Yeah. Uh, this is from Steve. What are some beginning tips on showing love, especially when it's hard for someone? That's a very good question. A lot of my resolutions are aimed at showing more love. And also, as research shows, that our actions, our feelings follow our actions. So if you act in a loving way, you're going to inspire loving feelings in yourself. Right. So like, I have a resolution to kiss in the morning, kiss at night. So everybody in my house gets a kiss in the morning and a kiss at night. <laughs> 
And also, every time somebody comes and goes from the apartment, they get a proper greeting and a proper farewell. There's no like yelling from the kitchen, right, hey, right. you know, it's like you have to come and say hello. <laughs> so just these little, these acknowledgements of someone's presence um, and coming and going are really, I think are really helpful. Um, it's interesting because people like to, pers they, different actions make people feel loved in different ways. So some people really love getting work done for them or you know mm. getting help other people want a lot of kind words and and other people want a lot of hugging and kissing so you sort of have to think about well, how does this person want to experience right, right right but i think i think saying kind things is a yes a great way of showing you'll never love. go wrong with that you know? yes. It, yes it really is yes. people don't say enough oh and and watch, it, watching out for things like sarcasm right. eye rolling right um you know, they're just, they're not, right. they sour. They're talking under your breath. Yeah, they sour people's moods. Right, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, kind things and then mm -hmm. refraining yes. from yeah. it's undermining nice things. When my husband says to me, oh, I love that dress on you. Or, yes. You look really pretty in that. Yes. It just makes me feel great, you know? Yes, and especially with a spouse, it's very yes. easy to take each other for right. granted. Yeah, I love to hear it. This is from Rice. It seems like you weren't aware of your happiness level before you started the happiness project. What are some tips for the rest of us to begin? Is that true? Yeah, I never thought about it. It was funny. I, I, had, I was like, wow. <laughs> I say I want to be happy, but I don't think I've ever really thought about my <laughs> happiness before. Um, no, I was very un, un self aware and was not at all mindful about happiness. So I think just thinking about it. Uh -huh. um, some people argue that you shouldn't think about happiness because you'll sort of trip over your own feet or that, or that it, by thinking about happiness, you'll get in your own way. I just... I, I, I just don't believe that's true. I think if you really think about, am I happy and how could I be happier, that's when you start seeing opportunities in your life to make little changes that could make you happier. Right. So I think that mindfulness, just thinking about it, asking yourself, wow, I really am happier when I go for a walk in the park, or right. wow, being with this person really consistently makes me feel lousy. Just being yeah. aware of that, then you begin right. to see yeah. how your life could, be, could move in a direction that would tend to increase your happiness. Yeah. I, I sometimes actually say to myself, though I have not been thinking about happiness project, but I sometimes say to myself, that's not going to make me happy. Yes. I'm not going to do that. It's yes. not going to make me happy. Yes. You know, it's kind of like, yes. I know what to stay away from. No, I mean, yeah. and I think some people aren't that aware. Yeah. And so they kind of make right. choices over and over again, which don't contribute to their happiness. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is from Yolanda. How important is a daily to-do list? Any tips on reminding yourself to use it and then cross things off? Well, first you got to make one. Right? <laughs> you gotta, and it seems like some people are obsessed with to-do lists, and then some people don't really use them. I'm not sure if you don't, if you're not inclined to use them. I'm not sure if it's a necessary thing to do. Oh, I could I, live without it. I'm the same way. I mean, I, I love <laughs> I my to-do list. And a friend of mine has a great tip. She says every to-do list should have one thing that can be crossed off within the first five minutes. <laughs> That's really good. You want to have something you're just like, okay, yeah. that's done. <laughs> I sometimes put things down there that I've already completed. <laughs> um, but I think it can be very helpful yeah. in making sure that you stay focused on your priorities mm -hmm. and get, get done what you want and to do. And what's more fun than what yes. you're all off? Oh, yes, gosh, yes. We're seeing that. an old to-do list yes. with everything. Oh, I did all those. All that. This is from Casey. What is the link between fear and joy? How does fear affect joy? And are they opposites? That's a good question. I'm not sure they're opposites. And one of the really surprising things in the study of happiness is that, that you think of happiness and unhappiness as sort of moving in a teeter-totter. Uh -huh. But they don't. You can feel very unhappy and very happy at the same time. They're kind of on parallel tracks. And so you probably, I mean, it's like having a baby. People say, oh, that was the happiest moment of my life. I was like, I don't think I was feeling happy. I think I was feeling fear and joy. <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh, yes. uh, here I have to take care of this baby um, and incredibly joyful too so it's an odd mix so I'm not sure that they're the opposites um, they're certainly very intense emotions mm. um, but can fear can fear affect joy can it stop you from having joy because you're afraid of something else I, I mean I think if you're fe that fear really is a major major happiness challenge and so right. one of the things to think about if you feel like you're in fear is are there ways that you could tackle that because certainly eliminating that kind of intense negative emotion would tend to make you right. feel more positive right. emotions. And some people say that if you really confront a fear and do something you're afraid of, there is just no greater happiness than to know that you've conquered a fear. Yeah. You know? Like learning how to swim or yes. learning, you know, yes. something you're afraid of. Yes, or giving being, a big speech if right, you're afraid yeah, of public speaking. Afraid to travel, all, all yes. the things that people are, are afraid yes. of. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
This is from Rain. What are some things that we can change that makes us unhappy? What are some things we that we can change that make us unhappy? What does that mean exactly? So what are things that we do that make us unhappy that we can do something about? Right. Well, one is like staying up too late at night because okay. um, yeah, I'm obsessed with sleep. Right. Because um, different things make different people unhappy. Yeah, but I mean, and I think one of the things is back to your point about mindfulness, like just to notice what's making right. you unhappy. Um, and the things that I hear people saying make them unhappy, one is being around other people who are very, right. bring, consistently bring them right, down. Right. Um, how do you insulate yourself from that? Another is feeling like their lives are out of their control in terms uh -huh. of time. Like they never feel like they're at leisure. They have no sense of relaxation. Right. They feel like they don't have enough time for the things and the people who are important to them. Um, and so, you know, some people feel like they squander too much time on things like the internet or TV or video games. And also, there are things that they re like. I have a, a very close girlfriend who's trying to lose weight, and she yes. says, "I never can seem to get past it." Yes. And so now she's really That's a huge thing. She's really working on watching what she eats and not opening that bag of Frito yes. chips when she's watching the Olympics. I mean, all yes. of those things that yes. you know. As you go for it, say, "No, I'm just not going to do it." Yes. I'm just changing that habit so yes. that you're not unhappy about the weight and that's a biggie and i think one thing that's helpful is to say to yourself what is the thing in my life that if i changed it would make me the happiest like a year from now if something magically changed right what would the biggest change be would it be that i quit smoking would it be that i lost 20 pounds would it be that i found the love of my life because sometimes i think helping yourself understand this is my most important priority for right. happiness right. then you can start to say like okay, I need to pay for a personal trainer, or okay, I need to go to a doctor and really talk about how I quit smoking, right. and really throw all your energy into it. But sometimes it just you just have all these sort of muddling things that you're right. working on, and quitting smoking is right there with cleaning out your car, right. whereas in fact, you know, right. one is wildly more important right. than the other, exactly. and so you want to get that sense of priorities. That's great. This is from Sharon Strauber. Gretchen, I find myself often frustrated by the fact that I'm not doing what I want to do. I work all day and I don't have time to pursue my talents anymore. What do you suggest I do? I have to pay the bills, but I have this fear that I'm going to end up never following my dreams. That's such a big question, Sharon. That really is. Because if you're working all day at something that you don't really want to do, yes. so you don't have time to pursue the things that you really want to do, you kind of have to what? She kind of has to work like double time in yes, order to do this, exactly. right? Yes. Or do it on the weekends or find a way to well, what would you think I think one thing to think about is that we tend to overestimate what we can do in a short term like in an afternoon and we underestimate what we can do over the long term if we do a little bit consistently so this is the same thing about suffer for 15 minutes and so let's say you have a creative project that you want to work on one thing you might think about is getting up an hour earlier in the morning when everything is quiet and working on that now probably you would have to go to sleep earlier but what I find from talking to people is that the end of the day for most people is very pleasant. So it's hard to turn off the light and give up that time. But on the other hand, it's a low value kind of pleasure. It's like watching television, you know, chatting, you know, like I call my sister on the West Coast, re cat reading the paper. It's sort of pleasant time, right. but it's not a high value happiness right. time. So it might be that if you went to bed an hour or an hour and a half earlier, and then woke up an hour earlier and really said, this is the time for me to work on this thing, you would create a space for it in your time, in your schedule, in your life, and then you would at least feel like there was some place for it. And maybe once you were in the habit of doing it, you could find other ways to incorporate it into your schedule. And I, I, some people are naturally morning people, and this obviously would work much better if you were a natural mm -hmm. morning person. Um, some people are not natural morning people, and this would, be, would probably yeah. be hard for them. So you could just change it and switch it, do it at night. Yeah, I'm such a morning person, it's hard for you to imagine somebody doing it at night, but I think that's true, like for them, not right. like from yes. midnight, you know, from 11 to midnight might be yes. a great time. Right. So yeah, so just adapt to yourself. But trying to set aside sort of a consistent, manageable amount of time so that you feel like there is a place for it, so you don't have that haunted feeling. And also, Sharon, you don't want to give up your dreams. Yes, absolutely. It's really important to nurture your dreams. It's, it's a big part of happiness, I think. Absolutely. Being able to nurture your dreams. Yes. This is from Hope. I'd like to know how you define success and how or if it relates to happiness. Well, I think that's so different for different people. I, uh -huh. I, I mean, because success is success according to what measure? It's sort of a relative term. Success implies that you're, you're more successful than other people doing something similar. So 
um, for, and, and, and what your idea of the good life would be. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, a, a success is somebody who is, has strong and healthy relationships with the people in their life, where they have enough time for all, the pro all their priorities, where they're working at work that they, very, they enjoy and they feel like they've you know, mastered it. Um, but then other people have different ideas of what right, a, success, right. a successful life would look like. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think, wasn't it Freud or somebody that said that, that, that happiness is uh, doing something you love, ha loving someone, and having something to hope for? sort of the definition yes, of, yes, yes, of, yes. of stability or happiness. Right. And I think it's true. If, you're, if you have someone to love and, and something that you love to do and, and something to hope for, I would imagine it would give you a, a certain feeling of happiness to know that. I well, one, one of the things, too, I found, at least, because I switched from being a lawyer to a writer, so I was in a job that I wasn't right for me, and now I have work that is right for me, I feel like. If you're doing work that you don't feel like is right for you. Success by the outside world standards becomes very, very important because it's the only reason that you're doing it. Right. Like you're doing this because you want to make a partner or you're doing this because you want to earn the salary, or you want to hit this, you want to get this title or you want to achieve this you thing. You want your father to be proud yeah, of you. Yeah, you want your father to be <laughs> proud of you. And so that outward success is so precious because it's the only reason that you're doing it. Right. But if you're doing work that you love, then the work itself is its own reward. And of mm. course, it's sweet to be rewarded by the outside world right. and to have people think that you're doing well and to be recognized. And that's always going to be nice. Right. Um, but if you're doing work that you love, then you don't have to. Right. It, 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 that's not the only, the, that right. success at the end isn't the only reason to do it. You see that too when you travel to other countries where they have very sm uh, small little villages and you see p very happy people yeah. with their you know, bread shop or their bike <laughs> yeah, lot, you know, yeah, said, yeah, wow, repair, yeah. these people somehow have the whole secret to happiness. And in New York, we're just struggling like mad to be happy. And yeah. these people are calm and peaceful and, yeah. and, and living rather lovely lives. This is from Olivia. Hi, Gretchen. Ever since I was a child, I was highly aware of how quickly I could be affected by other people's moods. And still to this day, I find myself taking on whatever kind of mood the people around me are in. The worst is when I'm in a great mood and I find myself around others that deflate my high spirits. Is there any way to avoid this without completely pushing people away? Like, and I mentioned this earlier, this is something that people mention to me over and over and over again, which is how can you insulate yourself from other people's bad moods? Right. And it's very hard because it's just part of human nature to pick up these moods. It's right. called emotional contagion because we literally infect each other with moods. Um, if there's a particularly difficult person, some good strategies that I've heard of is one, imagine that you're observing the person like a reporter and, <laughs> or something and you're just, you're, or like you're going to write a play and you're just observing like, what is this person saying? How are they behaving? So that you get a sense of detachment. So that it isn't affecting you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're almost like, you're a specimen to me of right. a middle manager who's can't, right. you know, narcissistic yeah. or whatever. You're like, right. oh, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> I have a friend who had very, very difficult in-laws, and she said she always imagined herself writing sort of a Neil Simon play about them. <laughs> and she said, so the worse they were, the more delighted she became. She's that's like, this is what, such great, you know, copy for oh, me. That's hilarious. Um, so it gave her a sense of distance. Another thing is, like, to try to deal with the people by through email or, you know, uh -huh. when you're not, so you're not coming up right. against them. Right. But sometimes it's someone like your mother, you know, yes. where you're, you're just, you can't insulate yourself from right. them. And I think part of it comes back to this idea of mindfulness and being aware of the right. fact um, and also, a lot of times people feel like they need to cure that bad mood, right. partly in self-defense. Like, if you felt more cheerful, then I could feel more cheerful, right, right, so right. I want you to cheer up. <laughs> right. But some people don't want to be cheered up. Right. Some people are just naturally Eeyores, too, yeah. where they just, they pride themselves on sort of that. Right. And the more I try to cheer you up, I'm just going to drain myself and deplete myself, and you are not really my responsibility. Right. So. To, if you treat other with, others with kindness and consideration, but you don't try to cheer them up or to change right. their moods dramatically, right. then you don't um, deplete yourself mm -hmm. trying to right. um, get them to feel different. But also, I think like anything, like any infection, you need a, an antibiotic. So yes. you, you got to go, you know, if, if this person is making you feel bad, try to find that other person yeah, yeah, that makes no, you exactly, feel better. Yeah, if you, as much as you can, yeah, yeah, yeah you, construct you, you your need life an that way. To it, yes, an absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. This is from Misty Cleveland. What was your inspiration for writing Happier at Home? I had this strange moment. I was in my kitchen and my family, like my husband was watching golf and my daughters were playing in the next room and I was unloading the dishwasher. And all of a sudden I felt intensely homesick. I was just 
like it was like I was at summer camp for the first time, intensely homesick, and it was such a strange for your childhood home. No, just no for my home right then. Oh, it was that. like I was homesick for my home, and I thought that's so strange because I'm right here in my own kitchen, with my family around me. Why do I feel so homesick? And I realized it was sort of a preemptive nostalgia for like this time of life when I had my two little girls, and there we all were together, and um, it just hit me that you know I've been thinking about happiness so much, but this sort of the intensity of this emotion made me realize that that home was really the foundation. It was my marriage, it was parenthood, it was my time, my possessions, my physical space, my neighborhood. All these things were really at, really at the foundation of, of, of if, if I wanted to be happy, then it, I, to be happier at home was the most important. And so I thought, wow, I really want to go think it through again and, and really dig, dig deeper on the elements of home. You want it to be a place that's comforting, but then it's also energizing and fills you with kind of zest to explore. So once I started thinking about home, I just, I just couldn't stop focusing on oh, this good. aspect of happiness. That's so interesting to have that kind of an epiphany. Yes, it was. I'm yeah. homesick for right now. For right, I'm homesick for right wow, now. Wow. Right now, yes. Maybe you're just having a... Uh, a really happy moment, you know? Well, and it, it was such an ordinary moment, and yeah. I think that's what sort of broke my heart a little bit, was uh -huh. that it's just like, you know, it's like, this This is happiness. It's mm -hmm. like the golf, my husband watching golf, and my daughter's playing restaurant, and you know, we just, everything, it's so easy to take ordinary life for granted. Right. And I guess at that moment, somehow I was able to, I, I realized very powerfully ha how happy I was. Oh, how like, great, yeah. oh, how great. Um, Let's see, this is from Trudy. Any tips for showing your husband or wife appreciation every single day? My, my thing that I try to do with my husband now is if he says, will you do me a favor? I, I try to say, sure. Instead of saying like very suspiciously, like, what, what is, is it? it? <laughs> it's my first instinct. We all say that. Yeah, yeah, well, what is it? Um, so yeah, I think being just cooperative, you know, because uh -huh. from your spouse, you just want them to do so many things right. and cooperate. And then again, like the ki kissing and touching and saying, giving someone a heartfelt hello. Um, one thing I realized, I mean, this is so, this is, I shouldn't confess to this, but like, I would read my email while I was talking to my husband on the oh, phone. I know. You know, and I, I was just like, we I all got, do that. I got to turn, Except you know. Except when, when, then when it says something like, okay, or goodbye, or you have mail, or, you know, uh, whatever, it says something that makes people know that you're Yeah, the, the alert, the alert <laughs> thing is going on. You hear the click, 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 click. Oh, God, it's awful. No, you can tell that the pauses, too, that there's just a little bit too much of a pause. Right. So anyway, so I was like, you know what? Because this is the thing. You know, it's the person who's the most important person in your life, and yet you treat them with I less know. consideration than anyone. I so know. I try to, like, sometimes I try to say to my husband, like, oh, would you like me to get you some water? Or, <laughs> you know, I do some chores every once in a while that are usually his chores to just show goodwill. So I think these little these little gestures little, are important. I agree. I agree. Uh, let's see. Now I'm trying that we we're running out of time, and I'm trying to pick as many as I can. Here's from Monica. How do you achieve happiness when you're bored of routine and everyone in your routine? I can't change my routine by myself, and other parties are unwilling. So how do you achieve happiness when you're bored with your routine and everyone in your routine? I guess you got to get a new routine, right? You got to add something to your life. Yes. And I think, I mean, one of the things I found about doing a happiness project is you can, the only person you can change is yourself. Right. And it's very tempting to think that I would be happier if other people would behave properly. <laughs> right. um, but you can't, you right. can't do that. And so if you feel like you want to change your routine and others are unwilling, I think you really have to say, well, what are the things that are within my power to change without other people cooperating? Now, that might be easier or harder depending on your situation. Right. We don't know the situation. But if you really think about what's, what you feel like is missing, like do you feel like you want adventure or uh -huh. more time with friends or more solitude or whatever it is, and really think about it, maybe you can find ways that don't require the cooperation of other people. Right. A lot of times other people don't want to cooperate. Uh, this is from Mary. How do you let go of unhappiness that haunts you, like childhood wounds or wrongs done to you? How do you just forgive and let go? Because if you can't forgive, then you really are unhappy, right? You know, I don't know. I am in the incredible fortune position that I don't ha I've never had anything very big to forgive. And this is such an enormous happiness challenge. Yes. It really is one of these things that for a lot of people, it's, it's just a major obstacle for them, is how do they, how do they get around the past uh -huh. and the pain of the past. But I think that there is a decision in that. There is, yes, to uh, think because, about. Because I've had people do wrong to me, and I've had to just say to myself, I just can't let this be 
something that's in my life all the time. I have to just forgive this. I have to let this go. Because this is, then I get hurt twice. Once by the wrong, and then once how I hang on to it. So you do, it's, it, there yes. is a decision, I think, well, in it. Well, um, the power of that, I mean, was brought home to me because I was, I was in India at a wedding. So I was on the complete other side of the world, at a, and I was talking to somebody um, from there, from India, and he was asking me about what had happened in the Amish shootings. If you remember, there was somebody who went in and shot yes. in a schoolhouse a bunch of Amish children. It was this terrible thing. And he said everyone in India had, was very aware of the, how the families had forgiven the family yes, right. and how they had gone to the funeral right. and how they had reached out and, they, and how they had been so um, quick to forgive. Right. And so here I was on the complete other side of the right, world right. and here's this sort of horrifying story but that you don't think of as being like sort of an international right, story. Right. And that was the thing that they picked up on, that he, mm -hmm. was so, he, wanted, he was just couldn't ask me enough questions about it, was this forgiveness right. and how powerful that was. It is very powerful. Okay, my last question, because I'm really getting the hook here, is <laughs> This is from Carmen. I have to ask my husband to do a lot of things, like clean up, help me plan trips, pick up groceries. It's been five years, I still have to ask. I hate it because I feel like I'm nagging him and nobody wants a nagger around, but if I don't ask, he'll never do it and I'll end up resenting him. Are there any tips on how to stop nagging my husband and having him take responsibility? No, this is a huge thing. <laughs> you have to, how to stop nagging, how to stop the nagging. Uh, being nag and being the naggy. Okay, so this is, this, this, May seem bold and, and, and hard to do. Okay, let's hear it. Don't 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 nag. Just don't bring it up. Don't don't do it yourself, but mention it one time, and then don't do it. And it, this works best if it's clearly something that, like in most marriages, there's some things that are one person's responsibility and something that's somebody else's responsibility. You have to just try this. It, I've tried it myself. It works for me, and I've heard from other people. Your husband knows that it's supposed to happen. Don't follow up, don't nag. Just let it go undone, and that's the secret. You have to be willing to let it go undone until your husband decides of his own mind that he wants to do it. So for example, with my, my husband was taking over orthodontist stuff, and we started getting these calls like, your daughter needs her appointment, your daughter needs her appointment, and I'm like, I, I'm not going to nag about that, but it's, it's somebody, it's my husband's job. And of course, he did it, you know, he, he, in, in his own time, he did it, it all happened, there was, no, there was no catastrophe. But you have to be willing to say, the grass is going to grow. Um, we won't have you, groceries picked well, yeah, up for I mean, dinner. You know, or what, yeah, let, let, there's, there's, a, there's a cost to be paid for that, it's inconvenient, you know. Um, what are you going to do? We have no groceries. You're going to have to go out right now. It's, it's 10 o'clock and there's no milk. So you're going to have to go out right now and get that milk because... That was your job. That was your job. You didn't get it done. So try it. It feels very high risk. Pick something where you can really stand and let it go. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah. like uh, getting the oil changed in the car or something where there's a little bit of wiggle room. But um, That's funny. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, all, right, all right. One last question. This is from Val. and I'm very interested, so I have to ask you. Do you think people who expect less are happier? See, I expect so much from people. I expect so much, you know, that my, my husband always says, the reason you're so disappointed all the time is you expect so much. He said, if you didn't expect so much from people, you wouldn't be so disappointed. What do you think? I think, I think, I think it, both things are true. Because <laughs> I think you're right that if you have lower expectations, then you're going to be easier, more easily satisfied. And so in that way, it is true. But on the other hand, having high expectations, you, you aim higher and you expect more. And, I would think that over time that might lead to a happier life, you know, if you if you have a bigger vision. Uh -huh. And um, so a lot of things in happiness, both both the opposites are true. Uh -huh. So maybe you're happier if you expect less and if you expect more. <laughs> well, if you expect less, you won't be as disappointed. You won't be as disappointed. As often, that's for sure. Yeah, but you might not um, you might not get the highs either yeah, because right. you know you wouldn't you wouldn't get to see the, the thing you wanted. Yes. To to, yes, be, yes. to blossom. Yes, you wouldn't have as big a vision for the world. Choose the bigger life. Thank you, Gretchen. I hope oh. we're all going to be happier. Oh, thank you. Everybody go out and have a happy, happy day. We'll see you next time.